Oh my gosh, I'm sure there wasn't that much editing. It's very real. Um, Very long-winded, so I bet it was. (laughs) (laughs) I want to give you a quick introduction about everyone here. So Laquan Smith, you started your line at age 21, built rapidly an incredible clientele from Beyonce, Rihanna, Cardi B, Kim Kardashian West. I mean, casual. Um, You know, your line is obviously extremely glamorous style, but it's size inclusive. Then we have Candice, who we already just heard from. She said she had her show opening last night with 11 on array, and it was an epic show, and it actually opened all of New York Fashion Week. And you are obviously a model with a strong voice and an incredible active wear of your own. Rebecca, my friend, industry leader, using your platform to create great change. Um, Rebecca is a CFDA active member and also someone who has built an incredible platform for women, bringing them together, called RM Superwoman. Couldn't be more aptly named because you are a superhuman. Um, Romy Soleimani. We're all going to repeat that after one. If you've seen a Vogue cover, an L cover, an Allure cover, the faces of Cara, Bella Hadid, you've seen Romy's work. She is an incredible makeup artist who loves color, and we were just literally looking at flowers back there, and she was inspired by a rose on a table. And you are also doing a show straight after this. You are bouncing to Ula Johnson um, and also Carolina Herrera this week. Lindsay Peoples Wagner, the best name ever, a rising force in fashion, for sure somebody who is definitely noted in the industry now, fashion journalist by trade, now also Teen Vogue editor-in-chief. You're known for your sharp, incisive commentary and also viral content on what it's like to be black in fashion. So thank you all for being here and thank you all for being here and we're going to get straight to it with a few questions and feel free to obviously jump in anyone at any time because it's very casual. We mentioned inclusivity, and you guys are all so vocal around social matters, um, and you're all fighting and opening the conversations about gender, race, equality, size inclusive. So my question to you is, because this word inclusive is bantered a lot and dropped into a lot of conversations, what does it mean to each of you specifically? So Laquan, I'd love to start with you. You've launched a line with ASOS. You already have an incredibly successful runway show, obviously worn by some of our favorite celebrities. But why was it important for you to do this line with ASOS and really bring in that inclusive element? Specifically, for me to be a part of uh, a platform like ASOS, I felt was something that was needed. It really wasn't happening. Think about it, we have so many um, collaborations with these major big brands, right? Like. Alexander Wing and H and M or Moschino or you know Lagerfeld or whatever the case is, where you know I am a designer that is building a brand, so it might not be at the luxury perspective that everyone else is. And I think for ASOS to be able to look at the scale of my work and to actually take a chance on me, and to really understand that Laquan Smith is you know is 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 something that has potential in the luxury space, I think was a great opportunity for me and also just for other designers like me to be able to you know, be a part of something greater. I also think that, you know, not just for myself, but I also thought that I brought something fresh and new to the ASOS demographic as well. And that was exciting for me. I think those kind of activations and partnerships is is my idea of what inclusivity means. And, you know, even down to the castings and the, and the models that we worked with was exciting. You know, it wasn't all monochrome. It was, we had plus size. We had, you know, different race, different colors. It, it, it was exciting. And I think that for me, it was really about um, celebrating women, celebrating just genderless. The clothing should be sexy, period. It doesn't have to be female or male. It's just, it is what it is. And just um, having the ownership of, of confidence and sensuality. So you'd say like the, the gender conversation is almost a mood point when it comes to your line? For me specifically, yeah, yes. Right. Because I think that, you know, it's, it's all about mood. You know what I mean? I, I'm not really into trends, but it's about a mood. It's about a feeling. It's about evoking the emotion of the consumer, of the woman, of the man, whoever that person wants to be. So, yes, I do. Love that. Well, congratulations. It's selling very well in here as well. Thank it's you. very cool. If oh, actually, these are the ASOS boots that I'm wearing, guys. There we go. <laughs> ASOS.com right now. they come in women's sizes. They do, do they? Oh, they do, I think, actually, yeah. All right, so you know where we'll all be straight after here (laughs) when we're late for lunch. Okay, Rebecca, since the first time I met you eight years ago, probably, at Women's Wear Daily Breakfast, I remember it very clearly, you were talking about helping other women. Whether we're on a red carpet, we're at a business dinner, we're at our kid's birthday party, you are always talking about empowering other women and how you can help them. And you are such a doer, it's no surprise that you have now platforms and tangible businesses that help other women, such as the Female Founders Collective. 
Would you say in your role now, it's as important to be doing this work as it is to be an incredible designer? 100%. I think that, you know, sadly, we're still having the conversation around equality. Yep. And it shouldn't be this way, but it is. And so I think that until it just becomes a reality, it's up to us, people that have a platform or a voice or a following, to use our platform for more than just selling something. Um, and to me, until we're paid 100 cents on the dollar, and to me, until you know the 3% of women that get VC funding goes up to 50%, I think there's a lot of work to be done. So if I can help you know, be the mouthpiece to get more women-owned businesses and women-owned companies, to shine the light on them, then that to me is far more important than selling a bag. I still love what I do, yeah. um, but I can't do that wholeheartedly without making sure that more female founders come up along the way. Can you just tell us a little bit about the Female Founder Collective? Because it's yes. incredible. Yeah, so we launched right, it actually. It's one of those ideas that you're like, why didn't anyone do this sooner? <laughs> So we actually launched it last September during Fashion Week with the help of IMG and the Wall Group. Really the idea that there was no way for a consumer to identify and know about a female-founded company. There's nothing that says female-founded on away luggage or health aid kombucha, right? But um, a study was done and found that 82% of women are more likely to support female-founded companies if they only knew how. So we launched a symbol. Um, we have almost 4,000 companies have joined the collective, and really it's about showcasing the seal and the symbol, whether it's on your product, you know, hang tags, on your website, on your storefronts, but also that we have now have you know, 4,000 women strong who are talking all day long, uh, whether it's Slack, Facebook, or Google group, of just all helping each other. I have this, does anyone need a, I have a blah, and you're seeing this community rise of women helping each other, and so if we can make each other more wealthy, there's also studies that have shown that we reinvest in our community communities and we give back and we grow more people either physically or uh, supporting and so um, the goal is to just really foster more female founded companies. So well said. Candice, I read a quote recently from you that says, I didn't want any of the issues I'd faced for so long to exist anymore for anyone else with regards to fashion. What were your issues and how are you solving those? I feel like when I say my issues I tend to speak for the industry, for the curve industry as a whole, um, whether I've been given permission to or not. But I think that I don't, sta I don't stand alone in the way that I feel. My issues were feeling represented and welcomed and seen. And I know that I wasn't alone in that. And I've been in this industry for 18 years trying to, you know, wave the flag and say, hey, 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 I belong here. I deserve to be here. I'm worth being here. And it isn't even just from a standpoint of, please put clothes on me. It's just, please take a second to really recognize the differences of women and the beauty of all women so that the woman at home isn't actively working to change herself every single day because there's so much more to life than counting calories to make sure our pant size is smaller. But if we only tell her that her beauty and her success and her worth lies in a small dress size, then we've just created a snowball effect going in the wrong direction entirely. And so I, you know, there are issues as simple as I need someone to dress me and that that's not possible. And as big as I need everyone to understand that women's lives are directly affected by misrepresentation of, of who they are. And so it goes on, you know, two different spectrums of as simple as a dress, but as big as dictating you know how a young girl or how a woman lives her life have you had any specific feedback from any individuals just saying what great things you're doing and any examples yeah, we, we, the dm is a magical place yeah, yeah, um is, and that is a really nice way to connect with with women because for so long in the beginning of my career you would sort of send a photo out in the world or if you were lucky that you could be quoted in something you would sort of send it out and not know if it was making an impact or if anyone was really listening it really has opened up the community to express the gratitude for, for the change that is happening from whether it's something personal that I did or just the grand scope of, mm -hmm. of the change that we know that we can feel that's palpable now. I mean, it's sim simple things like um, for me, I get a lot of messages saying that the women have started to set new goals um, actively for for their life to start running or to start trying new things because marathon, didn't it's you? something that I did and yeah. um, so it's not directly related to size all the time it's just about inspiration I would say it's it's just showing women 
above a size 10, that she too can do anything that she wants. And if she hasn't felt that way prior, if she hasn't felt like that's recognized, um, I just want her to know that that is possible. And, and you know, you get messages sometimes, it's like, I wore a bathing suit for the first time, or I actually looked at myself or spoke to myself differently today. I'm working to make these changes. All of that, honestly, is a cherry on top of a job that I, I don't even consider a job. Right. Like, this is my dream coming true. And to know that that has an actual positive impact on someone's life on a day-to-day -day right. basis is like something I could have never. Well, I think the fact that you were um, the first curve girl in the Pirelli calendar yes. as well. Congratulations. Thank you. I mean, for people to look at that, it's like it's beautiful. And that is the most aspirational shot. Thank you. Right. OK, Romy. Yes. The, <laughs> yes. Um, what well, I should know. The beauty industry is definitely one of the more inclusive ones, or it's becoming so more rapidly than anything. You work on faces such as Bella Hadid, though, and you know, Cara Delevingne, and you're doing these right. incredible editorials all the time. How do you keep it inclusive and accessible to us? <laughs> Well, I mean, I get a lot of inspiration sometimes when the girls walk in and from street style, from people in the streets. I always have my eyes open. A few of the shows that I've already done yesterday were all about inclusivity. I did Eleven on Array. I did Rachel Comey. And Rachel is someone who has done shows that have shown all sizes, all ages, all colors, genderless from the get-go. And it, it feels so modern because we're living in this world where... It's so important, I feel like it's our responsibility that there's all kinds of beauty. There's not one beauty for everyone. With that said, do you think there's, it's less about trends as well in beauty and it's much more about bringing out, obviously, someone's most natural, beautiful self? It's about you know, bringing out their personality, the, you know, their individualism, um, their spirit, uh, their you know, being your authentic self and bringing that out in, in yeah. someone, or right. seeing it in someone and let, well, letting it shine. It in your work. Romy Glow, if you haven't looked at it, it's very good. Um, <laughs> Lindsay. Lindsay. Okay. Um, you have had such an inspiring rise from being a closet intern yeah. at Team Vogue, I was in which, if anyone knows, is basically <laughs> trafficking samples and grabbing coffees. Um, I did it. <laughs> um, to the editor in chief of Team Vogue. You have always stood for inclusivity across the board. Has that been part of the reason you think for your meteoric rise? Honestly, interesting question because I think um, a lot of times when I have said stuff, um, whether it be controversial or not, whether it be writing about street style photographers being obsessed with only photographing a certain size and a, a certain race and, and, and not really paying attention to just the plethora of beautiful people at Fashion Week or you know, just the lack of inclusivity overall in fashion, I think a lot of times I've actually gotten messages of, people saying, I agree with you, but it's going to be really hard for you if you keep doing this. Like, it's going to be very hard for you um, if you keep saying Who something. Who said that? A lot of people, which is, it's fine, but I think because I know myself, I don't, I'm never the person that just talks to talk. I don't actually enjoy hearing myself talk. If I'm going to say something, I'm really saying it because I really believe it and because I feel like people should know that and we should use these platforms for good. So um, I'm not the person that's just going to write an article to call somebody out for no reason. There's always a connection. There's always a reason. There's always a thought process behind what does this mean for culture? What does this mean for the young black girl in Wisconsin? And that has never seen this before, because that was me. I mean, it's been a mixed bag, but I think, yes, obviously, when my Black and Fashion article came out last year, I think things changed because it was so many people in the article, and so many people, um, you know, were really, I mean, the interviews were really tearful. Everyone was crying. Everyone was really emotional about it. And I think people just realized, OK, like, it's OK to say something. It's OK to be upset about where things are. But it's also OK for us to just talk about it and it not be this taboo. We can't yeah. you know, talk about anything that's going on. Thank you for opening those platforms, especially on Team Vogue. Um, OK, so pop culture. This would not be any conversation unless we start today talking about pop culture. And you guys basically set the trends that become pop culture. So what you do today becomes tomorrow's news. Um, I want to ask you a couple of specifics, looking at you, clearly. OK, the dress Kim Kardashian wore, you probably all know it. It was the black latex strapless dress. It was your design. It was such a moment. 
the amount of column inches this dress got is when she had the peroxide blonde hair and she just changed the hair up as well. And stunning. When you're designing something like that, are you even thinking about it becoming such um, a viral pop culture moment? No, I think if anybody designs like that, then they're just setting themselves up. Right. I exactly. think that you have to design from within, from what's, I don't know, authentic to you and to what you're trying to say. You know, I've been dressing Kim Kardashian since 2000 and maybe 14. Wow. So our relationship has, is, is, you know, always evolving in ways that she's, you know, been supportive of my company from the very beginning. And so do I notice that there's a pattern whenever a celebrity wears something? Yes. You know, it depends on who the celebrity is, but that's not why I do what I do. I just think that uh, my clothing is for women who want to be seen, who are really comfortable with their bodies and want to look sexy, and that just so happens to be socialites or celebrities. But yeah, when that moment happened, I really didn't understand. It, it, it didn't hit me in the beginning. You know, I re remember driving in an Uber, and uh, my friend called me and was like, Bitch, Kim K is in your look. And I'm like, what? And so, you know, I get on the phone and I'm like, oh my God, like she wore the dress and she yeah. wore the dress, you know, at a Tom Ford uh, Fashion Week show, yeah. which I kind of was like, wow, that's incredible. But it didn't really click yeah, that, made that if you're going to go to Tom, you should be wearing Tom Ford. And so I really didn't understand the impact of what that really truly meant. And it was explosive. It was splashy. Right. It was sexy. And, you know, of course, we sold out of the dress, and then right. the dress got knocked off, you know? And so that Hopefully tends to happen as well. <laughs> you know, I think for me, like, the pop culture thing is, like, bittersweet. It's, like, great, but then at the flip side, you know, for me, uh, uh, being the brand that I, that I am as I'm growing, it's kind of hard when you have, like, bigger brands knocking you off, you know, based off of what celebrities are wearing. So it's sort of bittersweet. Right. But do I think that my concepts and my, my vision contributes to what pop culture is today, yes. You know, when I'm designing, when I'm creating, I'm listening to music or I'm watching films or things like that. So I definitely think that I add to what's happening in fashion or, or music today. Well, the, one of the most incredible looks, we all saw at Beyonce's um, opening look of the On The Run tour was that incredible glamour bodysuit oh, crystal. Suit, crystal yeah. I love that look it, so much. So mm. incredible. How did and that it, one come about? Was that... A, Even a, same thing to you know. Quick process, right? No, not quick at all. That one. You know? <laughs> that was the other one. I thought, it, didn't you have like t a couple of weeks to design? I some only of had two looks? weeks. You That's know? quick. Quick to design, that's well, incredible. Well, the, the work is intense. You know, the workload right. is intense. And even now, like how I'm like, it's three days before my show, you know, it would be a situation like that. I think when people say, oh, well, I want to be a fashion designer, you got to really understand what you're setting yourself up for. You know, it's about time management. You really have to understand how to juggle your time and how to take on projects. You get a fantastic opportunity, but do you have the resources and the time to really pull it off with quality, yeah. you know? Um, and so my thing is like, Having that incredible platform, you know, that wasn't just one outfit. You know, I remember specifically making like four different looks plus dancers, you know, that didn't even make the cut. But we did all of that hard work just for that one incredible that opportunity, matter, right? you know. And those are the kind of moments that I think I'm just more so proud of and, and just thankful for. It's like, it's just all of the hard work that goes into something. And it's like, wow, that that's, I mean, out of all the designers that she chose, she wore Laquan Smith on her first opening night. That really set the tone for On The Run Tour. So I was really, you know, just greatly depreciated and just felt, you know, all inspired all over too. again. And shout out to my seven, team. Yeah. yeah, definitely. There's Amazing. no, you know, there's no I in team. Like if I don't have a team, I don't think that I would be able to pull any of this off. Word. <laughs> um, speaking of trends that become viral, um, eye makeup and lipstick is, is one of the ones that obviously we all we see and it's an easy thing to copy usually but when you know you the one that sticks in my mind yours Romy was the orange lip on I think it's the living color the Pantone color on Bella Hadid okay. it was that beautiful orange and I felt I saw it absolutely everywhere after seeing that mm -hmm. do you ever think about that when you're you know you're putting on a lipstick you're like oh my gosh this is unusual maybe it's gonna stick maybe people are gonna have opinions about it um not really. I kind of just have to go with my right. with my gut. I mean, I always start with skin. I'm a skin obsessed. I'm obsessed with glow, and that's where like the whole Romy glow came from. So I start there, and I feel like it. You know, sometimes things are more shocking because you're used to seeing someone super contoured and made up, and and when you kind of break you know break it down and 
Um, no, I don't really think of it like that. I kind of really go with, with feeling and I'm constantly looking at the screen and you know, what I want to play up. I mean, she had a little bit of neon mixed in. Like, you, know, you just kind of want to take it somewhere that feels fresh to me and hope that other people like it. If they don't, they don't. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. <laughs> well, this, obviously, we're on the cusp of the new season. What's one of the big, I'm gonna take t full advantage of having her here. Um, a big makeup trend we're gonna be seeing for spring. Well, there's gonna be a lot of lips, a lot of this coral and this kind of poppy color. Yeah. It's all about skin, it's all about highlighting and um, kind of how to achieve that perfect skin without looking made up, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, I think elevated no makeup makeup is is a big right. thing a right twist now. Twist them from where we've been of late. Yes, and right. and uh, happily so. And I think that you know I always like to throw things a little bit off. So you know whether it be like pink eyelashes yeah. at Ula Johnson with like a little coral stain on the lips. Sometimes for me it starts at the shows actually. Right. When I see the clothes, that's one of the reasons why I love doing shows. So yeah, I did a coral lip at Ula Johnson, so and pretty. and uh, I think I shot. The, the, that Bella cover, I can't remember if it was before or after, but I was in that zone already and I already kind of, one kind of leads into another. So pretty. You're doing Ula later, any hints? Any? Oh. She's not gonna tell us, <laughs> <laughs> I'll try, I tried. Uh, Lindsay, Teen Vogue um, is such a zeitgeist publication. You guys are always ahead of the curve in pop culture. From stars to stories to trends, you kind of lead where others follow. Um, you have the Hollywood, uh, covers, young covers out. Yeah. Today, right? Yes, today. Yes, today. <laughs> How do you pick these people? How do you, you and your team know who's going to be a hit? This was actually a really fun thing for me because um, since I interned and um, Teen Vogue was my first internship and it was my first job out of school, I've actually seen young Hollywood from behind the scenes for a really long time. And we had really amazing people who were really talented, but there's more inclusivity when there are the right people in the room. And so I think that it was really exciting for me to bring it back for the brand because we just never had um, such a diverse range of different people and not just, I think it's easy a lot of times to just put people in lineups because everybody knows who they are or it's like, oh, that person has an Instagram following. But to me, it was really like, I'm gonna watch everything. I, I watched a ton of movies, ton of TV shows, uh, went to a ton of screeners and really picked people and narrowed it down to people that I really believe in and that I really wanna put on the pedestal that they deserve and that you know some other brands or uh, magazines you know, may say, oh, well, that person isn't big enough for a cover, but like I really believe in them, and I think that's, I mean, that's what this is all about, like using this platform to, to do something better. So. so you're picking people who aren't necessarily promoting a new movie, or, you know. Yeah, I mean, world. some are, some yeah. aren't. Like um, Yalitza Aparicio, who's in Roma, um, it's nominated for 10 Oscars. She's incredible, she's so ten? incredible. 10? And um, she's nominated uh, for Best Actress. Did you meet um, her? Yeah, yeah, it was at the shoot. I mean, it's amazing. And also in Teen Vogue's history, we've never had a Latinx woman in young Hollywood. And so um, those kinds of things are really important to me. And I'm, I mean, I'm rooting for her and, and all those other people in it, so. Amazing, thank you. Rebecca, we're just going back to the conversation about celebrities wearing clothes. Um, earlier on in your career, Jenna Elfman wore one of your shirts on The Tonight Show. How transformational was it then? And do you think it still has the same power today? Or is it more, is it switched to more the influencers as opposed to celebrities having the power when it comes to wearing clothes? I think back in, oh gosh, this was 2001, just to date myself. Mm -hmm. um, that was utterly transformational when she wore the shirt and he asked who the designer was and she said my name. That's all I did for nine months. I just wow, made shirts really? in my apartment. <laughs> I'd bike down to Canal Street, negotiate with the t-shirt seller, and then go back to my apartment and cut them up and bedazzle them, which, please, no one get inspired to bring back bedazzling. Um, it will come back around. You know that. And this I'm going to run. I'm going to run. And so that you know, allowed me to, when I was fired from my job, uh, allowed me to actually. Why were you fired? Because Sorry, I was Andrew. doing my designs on the job. So she was like. You're fired. Um, <laughs> so, but it allowed me to have, you know, 
not, I wouldn't call it an income stream. It allowed me to like barely eat and barely pay my rent. Um, but you know, that moment was really transformational. I remember sitting on my fire escape on Thompson and Sullivan being like, I made it. I couldn't even pay my rent. But I was the like, I'm sandwich. a designer in New York City. Um, so now I think the landscape has changed. Um, it isn't the celebrity that suddenly, you know, you sell 10,000 units of something like back in the day. Um, influencers are extraordinarily important. We, you know, have a number of them walking in my show, but I think you look at each woman for why you're having her be there. You know, is it brand recognition? Is it sales? Is it because they are not, you know, a model only? They have many different beautiful facets to themselves. So I think we kind of look at each woman and what we want her to represent. Um, we are a business at the end of the day, so sometimes we'll make a decision around someone that converts and, and makes product move. But it's it's harder to get that lift, I feel. I don't have Kim, so I can't speak to that. But it's harder to get that lift than uh, it was you know, back in the day where I would meet Aggie Dean on the street in a garbage bag full of handbags, and she would take them and then ride on, and then she'd wear something, and it would sell out. So I think it's now like you have to hit t much tons broader. of different women mm -hmm. and be much broader. That makes sense. Candice. Hi. <laughs> You've had a long week. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about, so recently in the news, BB Rexa was really upset because she couldn't find anything that would work for her body and no one would lend her clothes, then lend her the perfect dress. Christian Siriano, your partner, came to, um, t came to the rescue and designed an incredible dress for her. I've also heard this story, you know, with Melissa McCarthy. She had to, had to design her own line of clothing because she couldn't get anything, any designer to dress her for the Oscars. Um, why you are obviously doing your part, but what as the industry as a whole, what can we be doing more of because we have a lot of catching up to do? I mean, <laughs> I've thought about this a million times about how to eliminate this conversation, the, or this narrative, because I'll, I mean, BB Rex is a size eight, I think what? she That's said. So thing. I didn't I understand so that. Crazy. I will tell you a story. So in 2015, when I was in the Pirelli calendar, it was a huge moment for me, and it was my, you know, a breakthrough moment where I was really going to be on the scene now with girls who, like Gigi Hadid and Joan Smalls and Carolyn Murphy, and that's who I shared the calendar with. And I, I knew that when it came time for the launch party that was in Milan, like I had to come out with a bang. Like I needed to be on par. I wanted to be on par with my colleagues and look the part. I didn't want to not be dressed the way I, I wanted to be because it didn't exist. And it was a harsh reality to find out it didn't exist. I had a publicist making all these phone calls. And it's the same story that Melissa, that Bibi, that Leslie Jones said as well. They, they answer and they say, we'd love to, but. And I just wonder how, and at the time, so this is 2015 at the time, Sophie Thalay was my Christian Siriano. And she came to the rescue. And she made me a gorgeous dress in a matter of days. So I'm like, oh, well, it's like. You have to want to do it, and I don't know how to yeah. bang it over people's heads more, but how can you turn away from that phone call and think that that was, a, that was the right yeah. answer? You know, for these women who are having these major moments, who are so inspiring, who are changing the future in the faces of fashion and, and movies and television, media, and you're not going to let her be in a fabulous garment? I just don't see how you would let that fall through the cracks. And I mean, all I can think of sometimes is like as simple as make two sample sizes. I don't know if that's actually <laughs> like yeah, really hard, but idea. maybe like don't, you don't just have the one in the, you tell me. So you I do? mean, well, you I'm can make be really transparent. Yeah. I, I think that what, I, no, <laughs> I think me. what you're saying is valid, yeah. you know, but I also think that it's subjective to the brand. Right. You know, if it's a really big brand that can afford to fund the manufacturing for a woman that's not a sample size, then by all means, it's right. at their, you know, it's at their discretion. Right. And I think that you're right. You know, I think they should like maybe be not to, for everything, I guess, all the time. That doesn't seem realistic. But, you know, in, in a lot of cases, you know, as designers, we might not have the extra um, financial wiggle room to take on right. the, the budget to make a dress from scratch, pattern right. development. You know, if a woman is a size, you know, 12, 14, or whatever the case is, it's like, what I'm saying mm -hmm. is like, where's the support from a designer's perspective as mm -hmm. far as, you know what, let me pay for the fabric, let me pay oh, yeah. for the pattern work, yeah. or something. Yeah. It's just to start something from right. scratch with, yeah. with nothing is, to me, is like 
weird. I don't know. But and I think then it also, would be amazing to be able to have that conversation. They just turn you away. Okay. And it's especially oh. the bigger brands. Like obviously for you, yeah. maybe less. But if you're talking about these big, huge houses, yeah. I wasn't expected to be given anything. I, nobody knew me from a ham sandwich. So I was like, oh, I will pay for it. I will pay for anything. I was having bags delivered from net porte to just try to see if I could find anything to try on from there. Like I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was just I, going in all different directions and I didn't know what to do and I was like I think that I'm going to bomb in this moment that is my moment because I won't right. feel That's like true. I actually belong there. What are you going to say? I was going to add to it like it doesn't just have to be the big houses and they should they should do it. They do have the money. I can say that, you know, as a smaller company from yeah. the luxury designers of the world, we got a call, you know, Lena Dunham was on her tour and she needed something and we like we're like we don't have your size, but you know what? We're going to make it. Yeah. And so it took my team entirely off task. They went to the garment wow. center, they sat and did it, but like uh, again, I agree with you. If there isn't the bandwidth, but these luxury houses, they should have no totally. excuses. Yeah, you I say? agree. I was just going to add that I also think it's just it just has to be a priority for people. I mean, we were talking about this um, before we started. Of, I just felt like yesterday I went to Eleven on Array and Candace was amazing. Um, Harlem Fashion Row was last night and. I'm happy when I see other editor in chiefs there, other fashion directors there, but I mean, honestly, maybe five, like right. including myself, like there shouldn't be, I don't even know if there were maybe four other editor in chiefs, not even sure at both of those things. And to me, I mean, we can't, we just can't keep having this conversation and people that are in power don't actually come and show up and actually see like, oh wait, there is actually like a really beautiful dress that I can shoot on this person. Like if you don't go to a Lebanon array, how are yeah. you gonna know? Like how are you gonna actually support these brands, these women? Super. Like it's, it's, I mean, it's like the same thing over and over again, but it should not be a, oh, I'll just go to this other big show. Like if you support this movement, like you should be there. Because it used to be that we couldn't be in editorials because the clothes yeah. didn't exist. So now the clothes exist, so it really opens up all the doors, but they right. need to know the clothes exist. Still excuses, so it's, yeah. it's, uh, listen, yeah. no conversation is settled and, and worth not talking about. You know what I mean? Like totally. no conversation when yeah, it comes to inclusivity and mm -hmm. diversity and what we're all doing to change this landscape is a done deal. We need to continue talking and changing, and that's really what the most effective thing is.